racism and hatred and violence and abuse are not things of the past. The story I shared of my great grandfather's kidnapping by the Ku Klux Klan that occurred over, it's actually exactly 100 years ago, is the same story of now. Discrimination and the institutionalization of racism is in the fabric of our country. We know this. So now the question is, where do we go and what are we going to do about it? As scientists, as clinicians, as educators, as advocates, as executives, I believe they're policymakers and writers and government officials, as well as patients and consumers in this audience. What happens when our rubber meets the road? Truthfully, honestly, earnestly, what are you doing to change the future and chart a new course that is paved in hope, health, equality, and love? The disparities in health outcomes, the inequities that could not go unnoticed as a result of COVID-19 are the results of deeply embedded structural and cultural racism, interpersonal discrimination, and the inequities in public systems. Are we being truthful about the amount of effort we're putting into changing our future? Are we truly investing in preventing disease and improving the human condition? Or are we investing in maintaining the status quo? The reason I was saddened by the title of this forum is because I'm terrified that 100 years from now, we will still be talking about our strive for equity. My hope though, my deep seated hope and desire is that we will not. I'm kind of tired of talking about we need more data. I think we know what we know and now we need to act upon it. The time is actually now. We must be truthful. We must be brave. We must be determined if we're going to tackle the social ills, eliminate health disparities, achieve equity, and address all of the stressors that are causing dis-ease. We must be brave. We must be courageous if we're going to stop the proliferation of infections that shut down our economy. And we must be honest and brave about the causes of the civil unrest that are plaguing our nation. Thank you, Carla Denise, for uh, the full version of the Kimball, which is on the website and which, as Nick just put out there, is now available to be shared. And I, I, we all appreciate your courage uh, in telling your personal story and using it to motivate all of us to think about change. And I guess I want to explore that a little bit with you. Uh, a lot of the impact of, of your talk seems to be about the way in which we can use our personal history and our personal story to motivate, inspire, drive us uh, toward change and commit us to make change. Can you talk about how that's worked for you? you? You share an incredibly powerful family story. Can you talk about ways that's played into your own life and leadership moments or uh, career opportunities or choices, situations you faced where this informed how you thought about the world? So Richard, thank you for that question. And I first just really want to acknowledge the many people who I can't see, but I know who are out there on the Zoom call Hearing uh, Don Berwick's voice earlier gave me a little bit of calm, but also made me a little bit nervous because he is one of my friends and my idols. But his speaking about leadership really is where I wanted to start, Richard, in answering your question. I think we need to lead with love. When you lead with love and you take what you actually value and believe as the premise by which you interact with other people, then you can not only inspire change, but you can be the impetus for change and the change agent. And so listening to the story this morning from Miss D, as well as our facilitator around our own unconscious bias, 
really took me back to my story, which is a story of love. My great grandfather was a Baptist preacher. I'm an Episcopalian. We're all Episcopalians now, but (laughs) he started out as a Baptist preacher and he was preaching love. He was actually preaching that it was okay for people from different races to marry one another. His dear friend, who was a white Episcopal priest, was married to an African woman. And he was the person in the story who was also tarred and feathered and run out of the country. And so I come from a place where my family believes that change comes from love. And so leadership to me is absolutely what it's going to take to change what Miss D experienced. And the people who are leading these organizations, these institutions, these physician practices, and even if you're only leading your own little office space or your home with your children, you need to lead with love, right? And I think about love in maybe four or five different ways, accepting other people for who they are and where they are, identifying what other people need and how they can actually get it for themselves. And you facilitate that empowerment, making your relationships bloom and blossom. I love the speed dating, Daniel. I know we had some little blips, but it was still fun to meet new people. And I chatted with a couple who I'm going to keep in touch with. Learning how to get along with difficult people. Learning how to get along with difficult people. And then effectively dealing with conflict. Those are just a few of the tools that I have in my tool chest that help me manage some of the nuances, some of the incredible challenges, um, and this issue of kind of trust uh, that the organization has adopted in moving forward, Richard. It's really leading, but leading with love. You know, you um, at the very beginning of, of your talk, you reflected on um, a certain amount of sadness, uh, frustration. Uh, why was this the topic? of the ABIM Foundation Forum in 2021. Um, Wait a minute, 100 years ago, what happened with your great-grandfather? Why are we still talking about this? Um, And it seemed to me as I heard you say that, that uh, there was some sadness, um, but potentially frustration and anger. Um, How do you balance that? How do you, as you confront the way in which we are still talking about this. We have not solved this problem. And you, and you, uh, you, you said to us, you know, I hope a hundred years from today, you're not having a forum on the same subject. How do you temper that? Um, How does that nourish you? How does that motivate you balancing sadness and anger? It's an excellent question. And my mother actually listened to the talk. And one of the things she said to me is, girly, you are 51 years old. Slavery, discrimination, racism, segregation is only 50 years old. I mean, it was 1968, right, when we passed and executed the civil rights legislation that led to me being able to sit in this forum with you today. It has only been 50 years is what my mother said. And so it took 400 years right? 1619 to create the mess. We're not going to undo the mess in less than 50 years. So we still have a lot of work to do. And so that's how I balance my anger and my frustration is putting in the context of the mess that we've created that we now need to undo. I'm inspired by the fact that every day I get the privilege and benefit of waking up and interacting with people who care enough to try to implement change in our institutions and really proud to be a new member of the ABIM where we are talking really intentionally, right? About how we ensure nothing that's done with and for and among those in this organization contributes to or perpetuates the discrimination that many of us of African descent, descendants of slavery have experienced. And I don't say that to negate the experiences of my gay, lesbian, bisexual brothers and sisters. I don't say that to negate the experience of my Latino, my Hispanic, my Asian, my Southeast Asian and Indian brothers and sisters 
or those who are disabled or experience age discrimination as well as gender. But we have to admit and acknowledge that the institution of slavery is what built this country. The utilization of free labor continues to build the economic structure of this country. And we have to figure out a way to say that regardless of one's socioeconomic status or race, health matters. Health matters. It is in our collective best interest to eliminate disparities, to improve access to health, to use the data and the research that we have to activate change. It is in everyone's best interest, regardless of their politics. You're describing a world where you have colleagues, uh, you have people that you are connected with who share the aspiration for change and who are motivated for change. And yet another thing that you talked about uh, in, in, your, in your talk uh, was the way in which uh, aspirations after Tulsa, aspirations after the experiences of your grandfather were, were systematically suppressed. Uh, they, they just disappeared. They didn't disappear. They were, they were, they were suppressed. What do you think it takes to bring that back? What do you think is happening now that is leading people to believe, to be hopeful, to think change could happen? Um, and, and how can we get more of that? How can we have more people focusing on that possibility of change than the frustrated cynicism of, oh, it's never going to change? <laughs> um, George Floyd said this, that he wanted to change the world. I don't think he had a clue of how he was going to do it. This is difficult for me because in 2001, my brother died. There was no iPhone in 2001. People didn't walk around with video cameras in their pockets. And my parents and my family have never told the story because of shame. It's shameful to have a member of your family killed or murdered because of their beliefs and what they love or who they love. So we've never told that story. I think, Richard, the answer to your question is those of us who've experienced it, who've been victimized by it, who know about it, need to tell the story. The story of my great grandfather, I just discovered after we had a 100 year commemoration of the experience, was written by a college student at the University of Miami for a project that he had to do and didn't want to. Wow. I had no idea. He found me after seeing the Miami Herald retake of the story and said, wow, I had no idea when I wrote this paper in college that it would actually mean something to someone. So you talk about uh, your family making a pilgrimage back to Africa. Uh, your, your closing slide uh, is at the fort. Uh, where slaves were sold and uh, the Elmina Castle, if you have not been there. Yes. And the last line, uh, one of the lines on that plaque was, may those who return find their roots. And I was struck by how much your narrative is about finding your roots, is about a certain kind of self-discovery. Uh, and and how you use that um, to inspire others and, and to guide yourself. What do you think it means? Um, not everyone at this meeting is of African descent. Uh, not everyone of this meet at this meeting uh, has the necessary has the connection to their roots that you have. How do you use your roots to inspire? And what would you say to other people? Uh, about the value and opportunity, what route should they be looking for? So I'm going to uh, respectfully disagree. We all come from the same race. We all come from the human race. Every single one of us. We are so interconnected. If we could uh, just acknowledge and accept the connectivity between us and among us, despite the way it shows up in our skin, 
boy, we could make progress in this world, in this country. I say folks should not only connect to their past, but connect to your present and be really insightful about the future that you want to create for future generations. I'm very fortunate and blessed. And I'm going to be candid. This young man who was a student at the University of Miami wrote this story. My uncle, who is now president at Johnson C. Smith University, had to write a speech and he didn't know his history. And he stumbled across the story on the internet, which now our family has embraced, right? And so that was less than five years ago. Right. We had rumblings and like the family secrets and folks would tell stories, but we didn't know the truth. So what I say to folks is connect with who you are, not just in the past, but who you are now and what you want your future to be. Right. Our souls will be around for infinitum. The skin that we live in is temporary. It's just temporary. So what do you want your impact to be? What role do you want to play while you're in this skin? For your soul to perpetuate love and happiness and equality for the future generations to embrace and to experience health and well-being. I think we have to connect to what we each want individually, as well as how do we do that collectively, Richard, because I, I actually think we're all of the same race. We all come from the same origins. And I like to surround myself with people who have the same values that I have and kind of drive to the same end game. But I'm really good at interacting with people who don't because that's where you learn. Um, it, it, it's a little embarrassing to admit this, but a, a major part of my journey to having some appreciation or expanding my appreciation of how structural racism works came from watching a Ken Burns documentary about Vietnam where he chronicled the My Lai massacre yeah. and he tells it from the story from the perspective of one of the Marines who patrolled the city after the massacre had happened but before it was public and he described how every city was scary but that was the scariest of all and he had no idea why and of course there were a bunch of people who lived in in that hamlet who knew that American soldiers had murdered all of these people. But this guy didn't know that was their experience. And he couldn't understand why they couldn't take him on his own terms. So somehow we have to get better at understanding that people have different experiences than we have. And not to, as Scott taught us, fill in the blanks with all the familiar things um, and how to be more curious and be more exploratory. Uh, any, any thoughts on how people can do that, can reach beyond their own um, limited filling in, um, what did he call it, uh, uh, SMU or uh, MSU. Uh, MSU, 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 how people can reach beyond MSU. Thoughts on that? I think it's the interactions you have with individuals on a daily basis and looking for the opportunities to learn and to understand and to appreciate their, their challenges, right, in their worldview or perspective. You know, it's a very trite example, but um, I recently was flying. Um, my family's on a little bubbled vacation, and uh, the ticket counter agent was exceptionally rude and disrespectful. Um, and all I could say to my husband and my son was, we don't know who she interacted before with before we came up to the counter. And if you look around, she's here by herself. And so with that, all we could do is show this person love. And I said to her, I'm so sorry that you chose to come to work today <laughs> and no one else is here to support you. Right. I said, what can we do to ease your way? And she smiled. And paid that forward to probably the three or four people behind me. I think it's that simple. I really do. And maybe I'm a, 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 an optimist and naive and all the things my mother would say about me at 51 years old. I still have a lot of growing and learning to do. But I hope that naivete stays with me because I actually do believe that an individual person can make a difference. I believe it in how you interact with other people, how you lead and how you tell your own truth, the good, the bad, and the ugly of your own truth is important for someone else to hear. Uh, I was on, a, on a, another meeting just before this one, and, and 
I was talking about how we need to lead in patient safety and quality with love. And I was talking to a professional messaging company about messaging for an upcoming conference. And the, the, the leader said, we have to be careful because physicians in the U.S. aren't ready to talk about racism because most physicians in this country don't believe that they are racist. And I, I brought it back to, to your point um, really about um, structural and institutional racism. And again, not to negate all the other uh, groups uh, that you talked about. But I think we we're to this point that if we bring love into this, if we bring humble, yes. humble, true, genuine apology to this yes. uh, and begin to speak the things that you talked about, we will continue to move forward. That is my hope. I, I never thought we would be at this place uh, at this time in, in our history, but we are. And I couldn't be more happy about it. Th this is about love and leadership. Yes. You cannot disconnect the two. They are. They have to be aligned. And that's the courage that you bring uh, and that we need. So thank you. We can make decisions and we can choose. We can choose to lead. We can choose to follow. Both of them are equitably as important. We can choose to love or we can choose to hate. And so it's really a matter of, of making a choice. But I do say that knowing our history is crucial and critically important. I just wanna share really quickly, Richard, a couple of years ago, I had the benefit and the privilege of taking my kids on a, uh, a mission trip. We, we go on a mission trip with the church every summer and they went to the uh, fields in Washington, the Skagit Valley where the migrant farm workers are. And they spent a week uh, doing um, reading and teaching science and math to the children of the parents that are working in the field, picking the food that we eat and put on our table. And on one of the days, the kids actually get to go, get to, I mean, they're excited about it, get to go in the fields and give the workers a break so they can go to Walmart, they can go to the doctor. And the kids work in the field because they get, they pick strawberries, they pick lettuce, they pick potatoes for 10 cents a strawberry, five cents a potato, whatever the price is, and are making pennies per hour per day. So my kids do that so they can run errands and not lose their wage. On this particular day, they didn't get to go because someone had gotten wind of what we were doing. But one of the things my kids said to me was, mommy, but we didn't get to do what we came here to do. And I just kept saying, wow, how many people actually understand and appreciate the fact that the food on your table is still coming from all intensive purposes, free labor? There might be a lighter shade of brown than I am, but they're still brown. And so Dr. Wyatt, that institutional racism is actually bred into the fabric of our economy. And that's why I said health matters. It does not matter what your politics is, but we as a country cannot afford to fight, to promote, to advance the health of every human being legal, illegal, white, brown, yellow, orange. Because our health and our wealth and our economy depends on it. So I just think if you lead with love and lead with mission, right, you can make the difference that's gonna be needed for each one of us in our own life circumstance to thrive. And whether you're at the top of the food chain or the bottom, it doesn't matter, at the end of the day, we all deserve and need health, and we need to promote it for other people. My question is, I love your message of love, and, but, but I want to ask, how do you, when we have a cancel culture, <laughs> and I struggle with that because I want our students to learn to love and to figure out where we're going but sometimes they're young and they just want to anger and they want to cancel. And how do you turn that around? Did you? I know that's a hard question. <laughs> I'll just tell you what I do with my kids. I try to help them understand why people may think the way they think or what's motivating them to think the way that they do. In this example of the migrant farm camps, every uh, plant or a, a field that we went to had really large Trump 
signs. And my kids, we don't understand how the folks who are hiring the illegals are pro-Trump because pro-Trump means you're anti-immigrant. And so I had to explain to them economics. So what I try to do, and I do that with folks, is help them understand, well, what, think, what do you think is driving the person to think that way? What is the person's story that gets them to believe a certain thing? And that's all I can do is, and I have- well, maybe something that happened when they were 17. Mm-hmm. Holding your mic for years. About. Ask oh. questions, ask questions. Don't assume. When you assume, you make an ass out of you. That's right. You. So well, ask, I don't like, I know. <laughs> so what is it that makes you think the things that you think? I've been doing it with the vaccine hesitancy. Every single person I listen, even if it takes me 30, 45 minutes to hear their story, I just listen and I don't respond. But that's data that then I can use as a scientist as a policymaker to then try to figure out an intervention that hopefully will then have an impact on our ability to get people vaccinated. Carl Denise, that was just spectacular. It really was wonderful. And thank you for your humility, your own personal courage in, in putting your story out there and allowing all the rest of us to learn uh, from, from your painful family experiences over multiple generations. And thanks so much for helping helping us all think about how we can learn and grow as leaders. Uh, leading with love is a message I think uh, many will carry forward. And we're incredibly fortunate to be able to welcome you to the ABI on Board of Directors and look forward to continuing to work, work with you over time. Thanks a lot.